And now for something a little bit different. We are moving on to another Total War conversion for the uh, Tolkien mythos here. The Last Alliance Total War, and the eagle-eyed among you I'm sure will notice based on the message down in the bottom right hand corner and the circular based nature of the UI that this is a total conversion mod for Shogun 2. I won't waste too much time on this little preamble because I think the best way to introduce this is simply going to be to show a battle replay and that is what we're going to be doing between some evil men and orcs and some dwarves and good humans. That's a pretty good composition for a first battle to show here. It's been something I've been meaning to get round to for quite a while. I was asked quite some time ago, actually, to uh, give this submodel a look, look, but then uh, work, sadly, got in the way and things kind of got derailed from there. But of course, the time that has passed since then means that more progress has been made. So we're going to be seeing a little bit more from the Last Alliance in terms of content that has been added since that earlier point in time. But yeah, this is going to be as much a learning experience for me, I think, as it is for anyone who hasn't seen any Last Alliance content up before. But uh, other creators have, of course, shown uh, content from this particular submod in the past before. So uh, I'm sure that people are at least aware of this. But yeah, this should be good, because Shogun 2 does, uh, does hold a little special place in my heart for being my favourite Total War from a campaign-based perspective. Medieval 2 still holds that crown from a multiplayer point of view. Um, but Shogun 2's slightly faster paced nature, and of all the faster paced Total Wars that have come in more modern times, I think Shogun 2 has uh, certainly done the best with it. Um, although to call Shogun 2 modern at this point is probably inaccurate, but it was probably the first Total War game that had this faster pace, and it did the best with it, I think. But also one of the things which, from a multiplayer perspective, made it somewhat limited was the fact that there was relatively little variance in the armies. Um, which was good in the campaign mode, I think. It really added to the uh, experience in Japan. But, of course, in a total conversion like this, you have the benefit of being able to differentiate factions quite a lot. So hopefully, uh, if this is the sort of thing that people want to see more of, which I do hope that is the case, because uh, I think this, based on some uh, preliminary research I've done, this is uh, pretty promising, I think. Um, hopefully then we can start delving a little bit deeper into the mechanics. But for here... Uh, we will start things off nice and simple with a good old-fashioned battle replay. A 2v2 on a pitch, as I said. Let's get right into things, I think. So, as we behold our first battle in the Last Alliance, we can see ourselves in the forest here. And do bear with me, because of course controlling Shogun 2 is a little bit different to Medieval 2, as I'm used to. So it might not be as smooth as it usually is. Although, to be fair, the camera controls in Shogun 2 are fairly user-friendly, so hopefully we won't uh, have too many issues in that regard. I have elected to turn the banners for Shogun 2 off as well, just for a little bit more of an immersive experience, though that will mean that we we may miss a few things, because the banners are somewhat useful for keeping things uh, a little bit more visible in terms of what units are routing, what units are moving where and such, so we'll see how that goes, but I do think that the lack of banners does add a little bit more to the uh, atmosphere of things. And of course we have a fairly heavily forested map, which considering the factions on display today, which is a law-friendly uh, battle as well, um, is fairly fitting. And the first thing to note about Last Alliance before we get into anything regarding the factions on display here is, as the name may suggest in the Last Alliance, the time period for this mod is a little bit different to the standard sort of Third Age experience that I'm more used to showing on my channel, because of course at the tail end of the Second Age, as it were, we do have uh, Kingdom of Numenor as one such faction, of course, um, seen in the intro, as they were seen in the intro to the movies, of course, and just in general as we move through some replays and some, some extra looks into The Last Alliance, that is going to be something that does crop up again and again. Of course, some factions will be very similar to how we know them, particularly Elven and Dwarven factions, but... Other such factions are going to be uh, a little bit different, perhaps, and we'll start off with one such example of that. Um, it's not immediately apparent who's playing as who um, here, but Elan Elish, who is one of the uh, figures behind Last Alliance, is the person who sent me this battle replay, and he is the one playing as the Kingdom of Karakaland here. Um, the exact pronunciation of these guys, of course, starting off with a faction which has some difficulties in its pronunciations is rather typical, but the ancestors of the Dunlanders and the original people of Kalanardon, which 
again, it's kind of an interesting thing. You can see that they have uh, some influences coming from sort of late Roman Empire era and Dark Ages as well, which makes sense considering the general time scale of our world as well as uh, Tolkien's as well. But it is also interesting to note that obviously these guys are enjoying maybe a period of slightly more prosperity than what we would uh, know Dunland for. And that's true, really, across the board, of course, in uh, Tolkien's mythos, where it seems to be the further back in time you go, um, the more fantastical and advanced the peoples generally were. Um, so yeah, as we get on to the meat and potatoes of this particular fight, we have the Warriors of Viteri. So we have a line infantry unit, which is actually a fairly rare thing in uh, Shogun 2, of course. There weren't really that many shielded units, if any, um, in the traditional sense of the word in Shogun 2, so that sort of mechanic is going to be interesting to see in action here, but a fairly well-armoured, you know, fairly tanky sort of frontline troop, first ones in, makes a lot of sense. We have the Chosen of Te Teje, or Teye, um, this is the General's Bodyguard unit, I believe, um, and indeed this is the General herself, which, again, I won't go too much into the lore of factions here, that can be the sort of thing which we may save for faction overviews and such in the future but again some really good details on these guys as well you can see the axes that they wear on their belts the one-handed falxes and the shields as well the general herself wielding a far more menacing two-hander so uh, that's going to be interesting to see we have the Karaka folk crows guard as well just over here you can see another two-hander unit with Warhammers and the like, so again another type of unit which I believe there were Kanabo wielding really high-end samurai in Shogun 2, but that is not really the case uh, for these guys I'm sure, considering they're a fairly numerous unit, but obviously damaging, um, and in terms of the heavy hits they're able to inflict, there is a Dwarven faction on the other side of the field, so this sort of damage will be uh, pretty important for them if they're going to hope to face them one-to-one. -one. We have the Kinstreith veterans here as well, wielding large two-handed hook blades, kind of similar to Falx's, but they don't have the telltale curve in them, so similar but different. Um, again, a higher-end unit for the uh, the Dunland, pro the proto Dunlanders. Um, also, something of a makeshift shield on their shoulder as well. Again, really nice designs on these guys. You can see, again, a very distinct style to them. We have some cavalry. On the flank as well, we have the Lang Flood Riders, a little bit lighter of a unit, this, which I'm sure that we'll see other such examples uh, from this faction as well, as, as well of people in uh, lighter attire and designed more for raiding and uh, getting around the flanks and maybe doing a bit of damage before cycling back out. So, a couple examples of them wielding spears, um, slightly lighter in nature as well. And then we also have the Iron Raiders over here, a slightly heavier cavalry unit. Again, more you know, heavier armor, shielded as well. Um, but once again, Shogun 2 cavalry being what it is, um, keep that in mind as we uh, watch this replay unfold, because that is going to be the baseline from which this game is built. So cavalry being what it was in Shogun 2, that is what to bear in mind when considering these guys. We have some trackers trackers of Karakskoga. Again, it's, it's typical, I suppose, that the first faction that we look at in Last Alliance is one where um, the pronunciations don't exactly roll off the tongue in English. Um, um, that's my problem, though, I suppose. The trackers here, though, archers, of course, again, nice little buckler on them. Um, a good amount of uh, damage going to be put downrange from them, I'm sure. Again, relatively limited uh, archer pool in Shogun 2 means that uh, it's kind of difficult to gauge how strong archers are going to be against one another. Um, but they're going to be out here in front, leading the way, and I think that's more or less it. We do have some Karaka folk grabbers as well, wielding an axe, and obviously a very light infantry unit this. Going to be moving up on the flank. We have some archers of Viteri as well, clearly a slightly heavier unit of archers, also doubling as a pretty strong unit in melee as well. And then Eric the Second, guard of Anatar's Chosen, another general unit I believe this is. Um, this might be the general as well. You should be able to pick them out, generally speaking, in and amongst the rest of their unit. You could definitely see that with the witch's guards, but uh, again, we shall see moving further along. Warhost of the North, of course, the closest approximation to this 
in uh, third age terms would be Angmar, of course. We have Orc Warband, 200 of them, packing on the armor, you know, using those sort of fairly typical cleaver type weapons that the Orcs are well known for, and also mixing into that as well a few clubs also. So yeah, Orcs, interesting to see how they get on. Again, I have no real reference um, for battles of this in the past. I've done a little bit of uh, digging around before doing this replay, but I'm going in largely um, waiting for my mind to be made up as the battle unfolds, really. More Orc Warband again with varying weapons, curved blades, clubs, morning stars, that sort of thing, very apt for the Orcs. We have the Orc Butchers of Angmar as well, skulking around in the trees as they are. If anything, their armor looks a little bit lighter, actually, just on the eye test. Um, but again, 200 of them. Obviously, with the name Butcher, you would expect them to be a little bit more aggressive in melee, and going up against the likes of Numenor and Erid Luin on the other side of the field, they will need to have that aggression if they are to do the damage necessary. But you can see the size of the Orcish army is uh, pretty apt for the kind of force that you would expect an Orcish force to have. But of course, the western side of the Misty Mountains, this is clearly where this battle is thematically taking place with the war host of the north attacking from the north and the proto Dunlanders attacking from the south linking up here to attack Numenor and Arid Luin. We have the wargs here so we've got the orc war wargs of Mount Graham um, which is interesting because uh, Mount Graham of course again near to where Angmar is geographically we've got the glaives as well fairly in keeping with the units that we've already seen on foot so a couple of units of them are going to be giving the orcs their mobility orc skull crushers of gundabad of course technically on the eastern side of the misty mountains but they do control the passes up there so they can more easily move across to support their angmaran allies skull crushers of course with some big damage and fittingly as well by the looks of things looks like they've looted some dwarven gear um, to use as their weapons which again good Skull Crushers or Orc Executioners here, so a slightly lighter unit wielding two handed axes. We've got some Skull Crushers of Gundabad once more, and Orc Executioners sort of intermittently with one another, but plenty of damage here, but also maybe a little bit uh, vulnerable perhaps to missiles. And then the Orc Bodyguard, so the General here, um, just a generic bodyguard by the looks of things. I mean, the Banner Carrier is here in the middle. I guess this guy with his uh, wreath is the General. Looks fairly uh, in keeping with his men, but a little bit of decoration, of course, for the orcs, and that's the only thing that we have to go on to differentiate him from his men here. But skipping across to the other side of the field, uh, most of the Arid Luin army seems to be hidden in the trees based on an initial look. So most of what we will be seeing here from the outset is going to be the Numenorians, Numenorian pikemen, and as anyone who has played Shogun 2 will know, uh, the infamous Yari Wall was a massive part of the campaign matter, certainly early on, but even right into the late game, it was something you could always fall back on. Um, so I'll be interested to see how the long weaponry units dictate the pace of the engagement here. Numenorean pikemen will be one of the first ports of call, however, surely for, in particular, the Karaka folks archers, another unit of the Numenorean pikemen here, so fairly standard fare for a front line, but they will also be backed up in behind here by well we have Isildur himself so this is one of the named general bodyguards for Numenor much like Eric the second is for the Karaka folk um, and obviously a very strong unit of infantry that's wielding their axes in melee which informs a slightly more aggressive stance perhaps Numenorean swordmasters which are a two-handed sword unit you can see evidence of the uh, sort of samurai stance that all of this is based upon but of course the uh, telltale Numenorean style here. Very good looking units, of course. Um, slightly more up to date than Medieval 2 was Shogun 2, so perhaps more akin to the sort of thing that we would see from Attila in terms of unit models. Uh, Numenorean archers here are going to be returning fire into the archers across the way. Again, the skirmishing battle is going to be interesting here because of how uh, that often went in Shogun 2. At the back here, we have Numenorean heavy infantry, as they're referred to big tower shields along with their spears so higher end unit 160 men per unit is there anything else from the Numenorians that we're missing archers again heavy infantry so they've got some fortifications set up at the back which is perhaps where some more hidden units do reside 
Uh, we do have another type of unit that is here as well, the Numenorian Armoured Swordsman, which a shield and sword unit, more standard fare than the Isildur Bodyguard, however, as well as the Numenorian Heavy Infantry. In all fairness, I don't think there's actually that much more than the Numenorians would have brought. Um, but the only units that we're going to be able to see from the Kingdom of Arid Luin are Thrain Stonefist, the Firebeard's Guard, so a unit wielding a big two-handed sword, the blue colour scheme of Arid Luin as well, and here is the general as well. He does blend in with his man a little bit more perhaps, but you can see from the crown that that is where he is going to be. But the rest of Arid Luin, we shall have to simply wait until the battle is underway, and perhaps some more of the Numenorians as well. Let's get the show underway. We will just go through the uh, go through the motions of the units marching up to one another. The banners will appear as I hover over each of the individual units just to keep track of how well they're doing in terms of the old morale, Karaka folk trackers. Again, I'm sure that I'm absolutely butchering the pronunciation of some of these guys' units as they move forward as well. Fairly well-rounded force, though. Good amount of line infantry units, good amount of archers, some light and heavier cavalry marching alongside the far more infantry focused orcs by the looks of things. Numbers of course going to be more of a friend to the red team here you would assume. Standard units of infantry on the way forward. Snaga javelin men revealing themselves from the trees as well. The clue very much in the name of these guys but also looking pretty fragile on an individual basis, especially considering there's 300 of them. Definitely the equivalent of Ashigaru, if I ever saw them. The Reds definitely taking the aggression. As you would perhaps expect from an orcish and evil men force. The mod have, and time period may have changed, but the overall dynamic between factions remains somewhat similar. Luminorian pikemen Also, volume is the sort of thing which is going to be interesting. I think I've erred on the side of caution and maybe turned it too low, um, but this is the sort of thing which can be corrected as time goes along. Some standard orc warband, as we've already mentioned, are going to be the first ones in. We can't turn it right down to really low speed either. I think when the battle gets underway, we will be making pretty liberal use of slower speeds, mind you is a big orcish force, definitely the workhorse of the red team here, whereas Proto Dunland over here have a smaller force, but certainly they have a little bit more going for them in terms of quality. The Warriors of Viteri. Let's see more of those units. I'm just out of curiosity. Eric does, but uh, I guess this must be him. With his red cape, yeah, he stands out a little bit more. The helmet a little bit different as well as he moves forth. It's the Orcish general, perhaps, which is the one that blends in just a little bit more. Arid Luin rangers. Some long range archers for the dwarves moving in behind their makeshift wooden fortifications. But again, we can see here Arid Luin dragon slayers, crossbows, and two handed axes trying to. Maybe ambush. Ambush the enemy. I mean, I suppose they will succeed in doing that, but the Lang Flood Raid is getting a decent charge there into the Arid Luin Rangers. And another charge coming in from the other units as well. They don't want to stay in sustained melee for too long here, especially not when they're also under arrow fire from the Arid Luin Rangers in behind. Arid Luin Royal Swordsman as well. A sword and shield unit. There's stakes hidden in and amongst the trees here by the looks of things. The sort of thing which you have to be a bit careful of with cavalry, of course, especially with more fragile units of cavalry. But this initial Arid Luin force is probably going to have to retreat. I think actually what we will do is go down to slow speed already. Trying to get used to the faster pace of Shogun 2 is going to be something, I think. But Numenorean archers attacking the orcs as they move forward, but this of course is the bread and butter for most orcish armies as we've seen. Their ability to simply soak up the casualties. Uh, 
as the uh, Dunland ancestors may say, but of course in terms of pure numbers advantage, that's the sort of thing which surely the red team have in their favour, but the orcs being hurried into combat by the pressure of the Numenorean archers, I mean having to charge right onto the tips of these Numenorean spears, going to have to try and force their way through. Of course, even if they are capable of doing that with the extra damage from the Orc Butchers maybe helping them there, but stuff like the Numenorean Swordmasters, you would imagine, will be pressed into service pretty quickly. One thing that's always bothered me is the fact that when you go to half speed, the battle sounds get removed, which is a little bit of a weird one, but no matter. Orc Warband trying to pressure around the flank, but there's plenty of Numenorean infantry here. They certainly haven't overcommitted in terms of their archers, but the amount of damage their archers are going to be capable of doing may be somewhat limited, although some of the war host of the North's extra forces may need to be committed early. They're going to need that support moving forward if their infantry is too isolated, as it may prove to be here in the face of this Numenorean pike wall backed up by all of these units. It might be a difficult one for them to reconcile with, but plenty of stakes here. Eridluene rangers firing away, far more lightly armoured than their heavily armoured infantry counterparts on the front line, but of course it's more a case of doing that extra damage with their bows, firing for the time being into the skull crushers as they make their way through the tree line here, as the Eridluene dragon slayers are also in position. Of course crossbows were something else which weren't in Shogun 2 at all, I don't believe, based on memory. Gunpowder was more the thing there, so I wonder if they're used in that respect. Matchlock, matchlock units. Warriors of Viteri creeping through the forest. I mean, damage being done to them on the approach, but not too much. Using the cover of the woods nicely. Their support, however, is a little bit further away. That's one thing which also remains consistent, is you don't want your reinforcements to be so far away that your main attack falters before they arrive. And it is a bit of a, a bit of a task they're being given here, the initial attack from the Karaka folk, as they move into the Eridluene blue spears, also revealing themselves a solid front line. Not the sort of thing which is going to give ground quickly, but maybe not the most damaging unit in the world either. As the warriors move forward, Eridluene royal swordsmen may be a little bit more well suited for up close and personal matters. As they make their way in to stop the overload from the Karaka folk. So far, however, the front line, you would imagine from the force of Numenor, and Eridluin should be reasonably resilient from a defensive standpoint. It's more if gaps can be found and if some of the more aggressive units from the Orcs and the Karaka folk can really start hitting them where it hurts, getting in and around. And I think in particular a big part of this battle is going to be whether or not the Numenorean force will have its pike line broken. Orc butchers struggling after the initial hit where they did get in and amongst the pikes but the phalanx line so far holds firm and so far well, Snaga Javelin men doing their thing trying to go after the supporting we units in behind we must act now. plenty of units I mean, cavalry in behind enemy lines as well that's going to be absolutely vital iron raiders doing a good amount of damage to the archers who are wavering as a result of being harangued in melee. This though is what the supporting units of Numenorean heavy infantry were for. They're concerned interestingly enough but so too are the Iron Raiders getting caught in melee really. The longer that they remain under the close attentions of these Numenorean spears the worse it's going or the worse it's going to be for them. Other such units wheeling around. I mean for the time being it is entirely the human raiders that are doing the business. I think it's over here where we see the Orc Warwalks are going to be potentially making a move, although the Numenorean archers right there ready for the taking. Surely the Wargs, if they notice them, will absolutely clatter into them. 
Still that support coming in from the Javelin men as well. I mean, just the interruptions that are being caused here may be enough. Got some missiles coming in from afar as well. Enemy through warriors. Another force revealed. Heavier unit of infantry from Arid Louis. You don't want the Land Flood Raiders to really be caught in melee for long periods of time, although Thrain the Second under the close attentions of cavalry. I mean, as much as you don't want them in sustained melee, I'm sure, with such an accomplished unit of dwarven heavy swordsmen. A lucky charge. And the morale being what it is. You're forced to be under too much pressure. These land flood riders are really doing the business here in the back line. Maybe over committing to the front here, the dwarves. And if that's the case, more harassment coming from in behind. I mean, of course, the double-edged sword for this for the Karaka folk is surely going to be the fact that Eric Luin are going to have certainly an initial advantage up front. We'll see if the, the Dunlanders' ancestors have what it takes to hang with the dwarves in sustained melee, encouraged by nearby units. So far, the Eric Luin blue spears holding on to the front, but even here, a little bit of support coming in from the Kinstrife veterans, potentially. Some arrows being utilised from on high. The very best of the, uh, the evil men's units have not yet been committed, and Skull Crushers of Gundabad also going to be looking to land some heavy hits on the dwarves. The dwarves definitely have been the bigger target so far, you would suggest, with heavier cavalry yet arriving. The archers completely exposed as well. Orc Warband, understandably perhaps, losing in the face of significantly heavier and more accomplished Numenorean forces. And the Numenorean pikeline continues to be just fine. Numenorean swordmasters also waiting their turn. The remaining units from the Iron Raiders getting hit by the Numenorean archers. Heavy infantry in close proximity as well. Hunters from the Kingdom of Numenor. An even lighter unit of archers than the standard version, but these archers are still very exposed, although what are we seeing here? Uh, it is just Numenorean heavy infantry, so no real fast movers from the forces of good today. The war wargs charging in, but heavy infantry here to meet them, and this sort of spear presence is not going to be good for the continued health of the war wargs, but they can filter in behind enemy lines. Is this flanking move and the additional numbers going to be enough, or will the quality of some of these heavier units see them through? Numenorean Swordmasters, I mean, there is an infantry overload as well, which is never an ideal sign for a force being a little bit more defensive. As the Skull Crushers try and put some pressure on the heavily armoured Numenoreans. Or butchers, though, confident, tired, combat even. I mean, a little over half the Numenorean pikes still remain in that particular unit, but do the orcs have another wave in them that isn't made up of Snaga Javelin men? I guess would be the key thing here. Do the dwarves have what it takes to keep up, keep up appearances as well? I mean, Thrain the second now being pressed into melee against orcs in melee. The skull crushers doing their thing. Some dwarves taking losses here. The grabbers, also a lighter unit of infantry, but it's just finding these gaps and pushing infantry through them, I think, which is the key for the attacking orcs and evil men here. Dragon slayers getting involved in melee with those two handed axes. Warriors of Viteri. I mean, just having a look at the state of the dwarven line is maybe a little bit of a concern here. Under missile attack. Support coming in from the hill as well, and of course missiles coming out of the tree line. But the dwarves still find themselves in the trees as well. Kinstrife veterans now being committed. I mean, Eric II's guard. It looks like the Kinstrife veterans have taken a fair amount of damage on the approach, to be honest. Actually, no, 150. Eric II. 
close and personal with these Arid Louis blue spears who need a bit of extra support on the front line because they're getting overrun at this stage. And there may be Mithril warriors moving forward. Oof. Flaming shot being utilised by the Arid Louis rangers and that will probably be enough to fairly quickly rout the grabbers and they need some sort of win here I would suggest the dwarves because the situation is looking a little bit precarious but maybe that's their hope. In through these gaps, the units that are finding them are a little bit damaged, a little bit beaten up. And as a result, they could end up with some real problems. Warriors of Viteri, the initial force of these warriors, of course, has taken losses to the dwarves, but some of them are still reasonably healthy. And with more damaging units following them in, locking up the Dwarven line, at least in the middle, but maybe here on the edges where some of the stronger Dwarven combatants are, as opposed to just those blue spears, the Dwarves also doing a bit of a counter-attack. The Chosen of Teje. Going into the Arid Luin Royal Swordsman. Shield and weapon to shield and weapon. Mithra Warriors, though. More of them. Dwarves pushing in on the side. I mean, having a look at the overall picture, the Numenorean line crumbling, the pikes not able to carry the day by the looks of things, and the orc numbers starting to roll through them. I think that has more to do perhaps with the overloads that were created. Time will tell whether the support coming in now will also have what it takes, orc bodyguard polishing off what remains over here, but Isildur, he is still here, but he is overwhelmed by numbers, and the Orc General being his opposite number as well, one of his opposite numbers means that he's not going to be able to rely on sheer skill to be able to get him out of this one, but some Swordmasters now arriving in pretty high numbers. Will that be enough to save Isildur to fight another day? We'll have to wait and see on that one. Curvy blades and clubs of the orcs, is that the going to be enough? Well, I would assume that to be a Sildur, but we don't get a little little movie in Shogun 2 to let us know. There are Luin Rangers firing away. There's still a good amount of the Numenorians. Frightened by enemy unit the Numenorians, but still able to maintain their combat dominance. It is all over the place at this point. The Are you sure about that? Who? An entire army? But the Orcs are still fine, are they not? Yeah. Numenorians still fighting as well, but the neat lines of the early period of this battle are now over with, and it's more and more turning into a bit of a mass brawl, which should, in theory, favour the team with the higher numbers still alive. It'll allow them to manoeuvre a little bit more freely, but perhaps the quality still of some of these Dwarven units will be enough to see them through. Archers of Viteri, the trackers moving forward, shooting into the backs of these Dwarves. That's going to be bad for them, even as... Resilient as they are, looking at some of the numbers that the Karaka folks still have, they should be fine, you would assume. Anatar's chosen, the two-handers. Eric II still alive, and here he is in fact with his red cape. Over here, meanwhile, still up in the air. Thrain the second, moving across to try and save the remnants of the Numenorean force, but casualties sustained. The orcs that are in here continuing to take losses. The orc bodyguard taking a few losses actually with that volley, and with the arrival of the dwarven general, the orc general will probably fall in short order. The orc butchers. Still a half decent amount of them remaining. 
old bodyguard going up against what remains of Isildur's force and the Numenorean sword masters that arrived in vain to try and save him. Few examples of flaming shot being used. I think the issue though that the dwarves are going to be running into here is the fact that the proto Dunlanders have been victorious on this flank because it looked like they were going to be for quite a while. It's really only this one unit of Mithril warriors that remains. And I think in order to try and secure overall victory, they are going to move forward to other targets first. Aragluin rangers still hidden in the trees back here. The initial fortifications, not enough. Maybe the supporting units here didn't do the damage that they needed to. Numenorean heavy infantry blocking further progress through the battlefield for this one unit of a warband, and I'm sure they will be victorious in that regard, but I don't think that's going to be in the long run. Exhausted, casualty sustained, shaken, but not yet threatening to immediately rout. Whereas the rest of these forces, of course, it is the Reds, as we're viewing it from, that are the team in the Ascendancy. Still that one unit of Rangers, but if it was a unit a little bit more well suited for this sort of thing, I mean, they're firing at units, the war wargs in the background, but yeah, I think the cavalry superiority was a big part in the advantages that the forces of evil have managed to secure here. Ultimately, while the front lines initially were looking pretty solid for the forces of good, all of the supporting factors around it went against them, and it's looking more and more like that's going to result in an overall loss, although Mithril Warriors winning against the Warriors of Viteri. Thrain the second, is he still alive? Indeed he is. Charging into the archers. I mean, there's 197 archers with plenty of arrow fire to try and take them down with. As he charges headlong into melee. I mean, it is only trackers, I suppose. Maybe he can fight his way out of this yet. But the king himself. going to fight to the bitter end, I think. The archer's going to try and worm their way out of that one. Isildur's unit is still alive, even if he himself is not. They're going to move over to try and support their few remaining dwarven allies. And there's also another unit of Numenorean heavy infantry in fairly good health, actually. But is that going to be enough all on its own? shoot into a Sildor's remaining unit. Point blank. Good amount of damage done. The Dwarven King still alive. We haven't had a notification of his demise yet. This Thrain? Nope. Where's that all crowned head? Our army is running from the field. We must rally our men before all is lost. Well, Luminorian heavy infantry fleeing by the looks of it. Is that the end? Is that an admission of defeat? Not entirely. Mithril Warriors still alive. It is going to end in an evil victory, I think, even though the quality of the forces of good here has allowed them to survive a little longer. The overall macro picture of the battle certainly seemed to be in favour of the forces of darkness. Anatar's chosen. Still in here as well. Eric the second unit still pretty healthy as well so a good high quality bodyguard unit still remains. lengthy battle this as well which is good to see plenty of use of the half speed of course routing from the Numenorians they're fleeing the field so it is 
merely the dwarves holding down the fort late game. And to be fair, I, I think both the dwarves and Numenor were subject to the same sort of things. Pressure from the flank, cavalry in the back line, not enough to answer said cavalry. And so whatever advantages they may have had up front weren't enough to see them through in the long run. Those charges coming in from even the lighter the lighter cavalry ended up doing the business. And that is that. So there we have it. And rather fittingly, Thrain the second in the end game splash screen. Even though his force and he himself ultimately were vanquished. But yeah. Can't quite remember actually where the casualty screen is at the end of Shogun 2, embarrassingly enough. Um, ah, here we are. Um, so this was from the perspective, I think, of Illumi, Alan Alish, uh, getting a few good kills as well. Unit statistics, yeah, orc bodyguard, getting a good amount of kills there from the bodyguard, and some of those would have been against Isildur's equivalent bodyguard, but certainly I think the shock infantry here for the orcs, the extra damage that they were capable of dealing, skull crushers and the orc butchers actually, um, did a really good amount of damage. We can see here as well from Elan's army, um, Eric II did a good amount of damage when he came forward. The standard warriors of Viteri, that shielded um, curved sword and, uh, and shield unit, did pretty well on the front line considering the uh, level of dwarven force they were going up against. But again, I think the cavalry was absolutely vital. I mean, the war wargs, yeah, I mean, 428 kills and 368 kills. Of course, shock cavalry in Shogun 2 is always such a threat, and that is, of course, going to carry over to this as well. Langflood riders for such a light unit of cavalry, maybe not quite the same level of kills as the war wargs, but definitely that uh, pressure from the flanks coming in here. Good amount of kills across the board for individual units of infantry here, but not enough to make up for the devastation that was that cavalry. I mean, the pikes held on, but of course with the numbers that the orcs are bringing to bear, you always have to be able to front up to that sort of thing. Um, Thrain the second, 566, the single most impressive performance from the Dwarven Heavy Swordsman. Um, but as if to offset that, the main front line they had when the battle was still relatively ordered and even, um, the Blue Spears didn't do the killing, maybe, that the Dwarves would have been hoping for. But the Dragon Slayers did reasonably well, especially considering they got charged early doors. 671 from the Mithril Warriors is actually even better than uh, Thrain the second and his bodyguard were able to accomplish. So good numbers of kills from the dwarves, but you know you need that to happen when you've got this level of quality. The Numenorians may be more exposed to the cavalry in the long run, and all their archers maybe not paying off in the way that they would have hoped for. So yeah, that's the end of this particular battle replay, and this really kind of a, a basic introduction to hopefully what will follow. Um, a few more replays coming in now and then from The Last Alliance. Of course, this being as much of a learning experience as it was for me, um, as it is for anyone who hasn't yet seen any content from this particular submod before. It was a little bit broken and disjointed in terms of my own commentary, because I can't really speak with the same level of authority, because the meta is a little bit more hidden to me. Um, but hopefully that will that will come with, uh, with time and more familiarity with the mod as a whole. But yeah, big thank you to Elan Anish for... Uh, sending this one uh, to me. It's been a while since he first asked me to cover it, and I feel kind of bad that it's taken this long, but from what I gather, gather it was a bit of a challenging uh, 2023 for the uh, mod team for Last Alliance, as well as it was for me and my channel. So, um, you know, maybe it's for the best that it's taken uh, this length of time for me to finally uh, get get around to covering it. So, um, so, yeah, big thank you to him. Big thanks to all the players as well for being a part of this battle replay. I hope you enjoyed this, because I do intend more to follow here and there, mixed in with the uh, regular regular lineup of content, and I hope you'll join me 